a familiar text for us today. It's taken from Luke chapter 10. It's a Good Samaritan. How many of you have heard this story when you were little? Little people's. Kids' Bibles. Behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your nature and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers. He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, him, you go and do likewise. The elders have imposed a new uh, policy, that is, pastor, you are free to go on vacation, but we still expect 52 Sunday sermons in a year. So you're going to get two today. Keep track of it. First one is just your basic Good Samaritan sermon. You ready? Thank you. Wow. Maybe, maybe the second sermon will pump you up a little more. So the lawyer comes to Jesus and we're told, Luke has, writes it down, he's there to test him. Now we don't know if he's testing him to see the genuineness of Jesus or if he's like the Sadducees and the Pharisees and teachers of the law. He's trying to trip him up, trap him in his words, but he's testing him. And so the the test is a simple question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, being Jesus, and maybe we should imitate him in some ways, ask a question back to him. Well, how do you see it? How do you read the scriptures? What what does your vast knowledge tell you? Uh, Well... You should love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, being, strength. The whole works. I should love God and love my neighbor as myself. Good answer. Good answer. Now go do that and you'll be fine. So Jesus is teaching us what we need to do to be neighbors. He tells them the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan because the man is lost. And he tells them how to, to take care of those that are in need. And so as Christians... Your calling is to look for those that are in need, right? To see those that need mercy and to reach out to them, to to be a reflection of Christ in in your culture and in your community and to to take care of them. The Old Testament reading, if you paid attention, talked about the gleaning, that the farmers were not to cut all the way up to the edge or the corners of their field. And as they harvested their grapes, if they fell, don't pick them up. If they missed them, don't take them. Those are for the poor. That was one way to take care of the poor. And now we have different ways to do that. So go be like Jesus. Amen. Sermon one over. Pretty typical, right? For the Good Samaritan? Until you read the parable. Then maybe you see things are a little bit, uh, as Jesus is, is prone to do, Jesus takes the things that are right side up and turns them upside down. I think it's more that what is right side up in our eyes is upside down in the Lord's eyes, and he makes them right. Remember the question that the, that the lawyer came as he came to test him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is it that I have to do to gain entrance into the presence of the Almighty upon my death? And Jesus asked him, well, what do you see in the scriptures, what God has revealed to you is the way to gain eternal life. And the lawyer gave him a very, very good scriptural answer. 
You are to love God with everything that you are and love your neighbor exactly as much as you love yourself. And Jesus said, that's one of the ways you can do it and get it done. So go do it. Problem is, and the attorney knew this, because suddenly he went from testing Jesus into being tested himself. And he wants to justify himself. Because this answer, this answer that he already knew from the scriptures, he was a smart man. He was probably a good Jewish man. He knew what the Lord had said. He knew that God said, keep the commandments and have life. But now he wants to justify himself. Why do you think that is? Because he knows he hasn't got it. He knows the right answer. He hasn't lived the right life. Hasn't had the right heart and the right attitude. Some part of the commandments he has broken. He feels like he has the God part right. And Jesus doesn't dispute him there. But the part that's bugging him is that whole love your neighbor part. Well, you can almost hear his head going, I've done the best I can. I've given my money to the synagogue, to the temple. I've given to the beggars and the poor. And he's just going through the laundry list of everything. But there's something in him saying, tapping him on the shoulder saying, uh, yeah, it's not, that's not good. That's not enough. And so he wants to justify himself I think to Jesus, but more to himself and to his God as he considers and weighs this out. So that's why he asks the question, well then, who's my neighbor? Maybe if the field is narrowed down, I, I have a shot at it. And then Jesus tells him a parable about a neighbor. A man was going up to Jericho from Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, he fell in among thieves and robbers, and they stripped him, they whooped on him, and they left him half dead. And along comes a priest. The priest sees him and passes by on the other side. Now, we can have commentaries, well, did they not want to become ceremonially unclean and have to invest time and money to get clean again before they can do their duties and blah, blah, blah. Was he just lazy? Who knows? He sees him. He is one that he should expect help from. The priest should help. He gets on the far side of the road and goes by. Then along comes a Levite, and a Levite is just like, he's the assistant priest. He's the elders of your congregation. And he sees the man, and maybe he sees the, the footprints of the priest, but he veers off to the side of the road as well, probably gets way over there on the shoulder and keeps going. Two people who the attorney should think would stop and help have passed this man by. Then along comes a Samaritan. He's an outcast. We can't expect anything really good to come out of him. And he stops. And he cares for him. He, he puts his gifts to work on this man and begins to work healing on him and then picks him up and puts him on his own animal, <clears throat> and takes him to an inn, provides a place for him, and then pays the cost of healing this man. The question is not, is the man on the road the neighbor? That's not what Jesus asked. He says, which of the three, the priest, the Levite, or that Samaritan, was the neighbor. It was a Samaritan. What Jesus is telling that man, as that man is trying to process out how he's going to be saved by loving his neighbor, what Jesus is telling that man is that he cannot save himself. You see, the attorney is the one laying on the road. Naked, beaten, half dead. 
The neighbor is the one who rescued him. Who's the neighbor? It's Jesus. It's Christ. It's not you looking to say, who's my neighbor? My neighbor are those people in, my, in need of my care. No. The neighbor is Jesus Christ. The one outcast. He came to that which was his own, the ones he had created and called and formed to be his people, and they rejected him. They actually took him, and they would turn him over to a Roman governor who would then have him executed because they were about to riot. Outcast, no expectation of anything from him. He dies and they're sure that this whole movement of Jesus is going to crumble and fall away because <coughs> his disciples ran in the Garden of Gethsemane. They're hiding. One of them is, is hiding among the women as he's being crucified. The rest of them have scattered. This whole thing of Jesus is going to go bye-bye really quickly. But this outcast, this unexpected person is our neighbor. He's the one who comes and rescues. He's the one who comes and saves. He's the one who will redeem us and carry us on his own back to a place he has prepared for us and he will pay the cost to make us well and whole. That's your good neighbor. So now you go back to Sermon 1. Since God has looked upon you and had such compassion seeing you laying there naked, beaten, and half dead, and he has had enough love for you to send his son to rescue you and bear the cost. The question is not who is your neighbor that you need to go. It is to whom will you be the neighbor? It gets flipped upside down. To whom do you need to help? To, to render assistance and to rescue. Maybe it is Maybe it is with some money. Maybe it's a blanket. Maybe it's shoes. Maybe it's socks. Maybe it's a bottle of water. Maybe it's the living, beautiful Word of God that will rescue their soul and bring healing and restoration. It's not who are your neighbors. It is to whom will you be a neighbor. Because God has first been your neighbor. God has taken you and rescued you. And now it's your opportunity to reflect this to other people. See, I think we like to jump back into the shoes of the attorney. We want a moral answer to this. We want to know how to be saved and we want to do it ourselves. And so we look at the parable of the Good Samaritan and we say, ah, oh, this is a how-to how I'm going to save myself. Great. Folks, it's a story of it was done. Of how God has done it for you through Christ. And the question that comes up at the end is now what are you going to do with this? Now that you have been picked up, healed, and restored. To whom will you be a neighbor? Physically, emotionally, or spiritually? You have to admit, the world is full of hurt, isn't it? In all of those areas. And I pray that the Lord will allow compassion to override some of, some of your skepticism, your cynicism, or your selfishness. That you will look with mercy upon people but with wisdom, with discernment, that you will prove to be a neighbor as Christ has been yours. And when you have the opportunity, share the promise of God. Whatever the promise is that they need to hear. That they have a neighbor who's come to rescue them. And his name is Jesus Christ.
Amen. There's two sermons for you today for the price of one. And you're welcome. May God receive the glory. May God work in his church that we might reflect him. That his church and his people would be the neighbor that the world needs right now. Amen. Well, now worship the Lord with.